where you are on your spiritual journey, if you consider yourself spiritually mature or kind of an infinite in your faith, uh, Rooted will take you to the next level. So I would encourage anyone who has not participated in this, it's a 10-week small group experience, uh, giving you tools and disciplines uh, to deepen your walk uh, with Christ and your faith in Christ. So uh, there's a Rooted table in the commons area on your way out. You can stop and get your questions answered and hopefully sign up uh, for our next season. So welcome to our third installment in this series entitled Battle Ready. Everybody say Battle Ready. Battle Ready. We are talking about spiritual warfare and the weapons of those warfare. Uh, In that warfare, it was inspired by a passage that I found in Judges chapter 3 that says, These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare. He did this to teach warfare. The reason he allowed these enemies to stay in the land was to teach his children warfare, the, the descendants of the Israelites who had not yet had previous battle experience. So the context of this, uh, the nation of Israel is in the fight of their lives. Their entire future is hinged on them possessing the land that God has led them to, driving out their enemies, but for whatever reason, they failed to do that. God delivers them from Egypt, leads them through the desert, uh, leads them into the promised land. But difficulty, time, They got tired, they compromised, they just sat down, kind of what John said in his testimony, for whatever reason, we kind of get lax, we lose focus, and we can easily uh, sidestep uh, our our spiritual journey. So God allowed these enemy nations to remain in the land, which doesn't sound like a very good idea, right? But it was for their good to teach them warfare, because life is a struggle. Why would God not protect his own children from enemy nations? Well, we're going to get insight into that today. Fast forward to the New Testament that makes clear that we are engaged in a battle we call spiritual warfare uh, that is much more uh, about driving out those enemies uh, than living in the flesh. This is a spiritual warfare. We're learning this in this series. You and I are created spiritual beings, but we inhabit a physical body. We have a spirit that is eternal. And that spirit is connected to, a, to the spiritual realm. Paul says this in Ephesians 6. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It is not physical, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says this in 2 Corinthians, for our weapons, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, it is not physical, but it has divine power, they have divine power to destroy the strongholds in our lives. So in this series, we are learning how to be battle ready and to use the weapons that we use in this spiritual warfare that have divine power for ultimate victory. The Bible mentions several weapons of warfare. In this series, we're looking at three particular ones. Last week, we looked at precepts. Next week, we're going to look at worship. Today, we're looking at prayer. And here's the deal. Friends, the more you understand what happens in the physical realm it is being shaped by what is happening in the spiritual realm. Friends, you are, spirit, you are spiritual before you are physical. You are spiritual more than you are physical. And our, our problem is that we live and operate in a physical uh, experience, and we often neglect the sight of what is going on spiritually. But the more we understand this, uh, the more it affects the fact that we pray, the the place of prayer in our lives and the practice of prayer in our lives. It it will transform. If we understand this, it will transform the fact that we pray, how we pray, what we pray for, and the expectations of having prayed. Prayer as a weapon in the spiritual battle. Now, I have spoken on prayer many times, had series on prayer. Every time I preach on prayer, I'm always reminded of the words of C.J. Vaughn, quoted in Oswald Chambers' book, Spiritual Leadership, where he said, If I wished to humble anyone, I should question him about his prayers. I know nothing to compare with this topic for its sorrowful self-confessions. Anybody have any sorrowful self-confessions? I stand before you today as your pastor with a sorrowful self-confession. I am guilty of many things. Praying too much is not one of them. By the sound of the room, I am not alone. (laughs) One of the things, the one thing that the disciples wanted to learn from Jesus was not demon casting and miracle making. It was on how to pray. How to pray. I have never, in my 46 years of ministry, I have never had anyone come to me and say, Pastor, I need help. Teach me how to cut down on my prayer life. I'm just spending too much time in prayer. 
So today we pick up where we left off last week in Ephesians 6, where Paul told us to pick up the, to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then he tells us to combine that with this next battle weapon, which is prayer. Uh, prayer. Uh, it's it's a short verse that we're going to look at today, and so I'm going to have you stand, and we're all going to read this verse out loud together. Ephesians 6, 18. So here we go. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Quick and sweet. Sit down. Uh, the Bible is clear, friends. Before... Before you are a physical being, you are a spiritual being connected to a spiritual realm. In this life, everything visible and physical is preceded by what is invisible and spiritual. We don't give a lot of thought to that in our physical world. So what is prayer? Prayer is engaging both realms. What is prayer in its most basic form? What is prayer? Well, let me ask you, uh, how many of you can talk? Any talkers in the room? Some of us need to cut down on our talking, right? But we, can, we all know how to talk. Friends, prayer is talking. Prayer is, 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 is a physical human being talking to a spiritual eternal being. At the heart of prayer is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone you love and with someone who loves you. Prayer in its most in, uh, simplest form is just having a conversation with God. It doesn't need to be formal. It doesn't me need to be articulate. It doesn't need to be religious. In fact, Jesus warned us against making prayer rote and, uh, and routine. It just means that you are you with your own thoughts and desires going to God, talking to God who created you and redeemed you and wants a relationship with you. He actually wants to talk to you and he wants you to talk to him. And so he's given you this gift of prayer as a way of engaging your physical existence with the spiritual existence in which you were formed for. Why? Because this world is a struggle, because life is a fight, because this, this spiritual kingdom that we're trying to live in uh, David Jeremiah defined prayer as this, earthly permission for heavenly interference. Earthly permission for heavenly interference. When you pray, you are engaging the God of heaven, asking him to participate in the happenings of earth. You are in prayer giving God earthly permission. Friends, this is an important concept. You are giving God earthly permission to interfere in, in the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Friends, he taught us to pray that, to invite God's kingdom into this world. And so what, do, what can we learn from Paul in this verse about prayer? Three things. Number one, pray at all times. Pray persistently. Pray at all times. Second Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Now, to pray without ceasing, what does that mean? I mean, it's not like that you're talking all the time to God with visible words. Basically, what that means is to be in a constant posture of communication and connection with God, to just never be without God in your life, with, without God in your thoughts. We talked about the battle of the mind in this spiritual warfare. It all starts in the mind with your thoughts. You're always thinking. You're never away, with your, uh, you're never away from your thoughts. You're never without your thoughts. And so prayer, the exercise of prayer, engages those thoughts, engages your mind with the mind of God in the spiritual realm. Aligns your thoughts with the thoughts of God. Paul encourages us to place ourselves in this posture of prayer, to pray at all times, all throughout the day, whatever's going on with you, whatever you're entering into, you just talk to God first before you talk to anybody else. And I do, I have this constant kind of, this unending dialogue with God all day long, throughout the day. I'm constantly saying, oh, thank you, God, for that. <laughs> or, God, help me with that. Or, can you believe what just happened? Well, yeah, you can, you're God, right? So let me, can I talk to you about that? <laughs> But when I do that, and I do fail to do that at times, when I stop doing that, when I quit engaging God in a constant posture of prayer, my mind can go very quickly somewhere else, and it's never good. It is never good. We talked about that. Why should I pray, be in a constant posture of prayer? There are many reasons, and this is one of them. Friends, prayer protects your mind 
from satanic attack because you're placing your mind in the spiritual realm. Those thoughts of guilt and fear and shame and anger and resentment and bitterness, all of those strongholds that we've been talking about, all of those dark, destructive thoughts that I can so readily give my mind to is blocked when I remain in a posture of talking to God. When you take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the thoughts of God, and you attach your thoughts, your prayers to that, so the question is, how do you do that? Philippians chapter 4, Paul wrote this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely. He, he gives us a whole list of things to, to think about. That's the way he ends. Think about these things. Focus your mind on these things, which are godly things, godly thoughts. But before that, before that instruction, he calls us to pray. In verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer... Pray about everything, and then he says, whatever is true, noble, it gives us a list. Think about these things. Don't worry. Friends, worry is spiritual attack. Worry is a spiritual stronghold. How do you ward off worry? You pray, and then you think. You pray, you align your mind with the mind of God, and you allow that mind to protect and guard your heart. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. You can't pray without thinking, and your thoughts generate your prayers. And so when you allow the Word of God to guide those thoughts, you are engaging the spiritual realm with your prayers so that the peace of God can guard your heart and mind. In the kingdom of God, peace is a person, is a relationship. In this world, peace is whatever, uh, is, is always the absence of something, Chaos, noise, conflict, trouble, whatever it is. Get rid of the problem and I can be at peace. But in the kingdom of God, you can be in the midst of all of those things and be at peace. Because peace is not a circumstance. It is a relationship. It is a person. And so prayer puts us in the realm, in the environment of that peace, of the God of peace. Listen, you cannot afford not to pray. If this was the only reason to pray at all times, it would be reason enough. But wait, there's more. James chapter 4, verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not. What's the implication of this verse? You did not ask, therefore you do not have. There are things you do not have from God because you did not ask God for those things. Jesus said not to worry about the things that you need because your Father in heaven knows that you need them. He is a good Father whose children never go without bread. The Bible tells us to pray for our needs, but the Bible also tells us not to obsess over those needs because you have a God in heaven who is a good Father who knows what you need and he has promised to supply those needs. So you pray for those needs and then you trust the source of your supply to supply those needs because you have a Father who loves you. But then we read a verse like James 4, 2, that tells us you do not have because you do not ask. You, do, you, did not, you, do not, you did not pray. So what is this? What is this? Would you agree with me? And it's okay if you don't. Everyone has the right to be wrong. But wouldn't you agree that we don't have a God of supply? We have a God of abundant supply. Would you agree with that? That we don't just have a Father who gives us our needs. We have a Father who gives us far beyond. Ephesians 3 tells us that we have a God who is willing and able. He is able and willing to do far more than we ask or imagine. Earlier in this letter, James reminds us that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Jesus says in Matthew 7, How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? Give good gifts. Say that. Give good gifts. To those who ask him, James tells, or Jesus tells us that if we know how to give good gifts, gifts to those that we love, how much more does your father in heaven want to give gifts to his children? So it's not just needs, it's gift. A gift is not a need, right? A gift is, a, a, is not a necessity. Gifts are above and beyond what is needed. So you go back to James 4, 2, you don't have because you don't ask. Get this, friends, the lack of prayer in your life will create a lack of good in your life. That's pretty powerful. A lack of prayer in your life will create a lack of good in your life. Why? Because there are things that God wants to give you and is able to give you, but because you haven't asked him to give you those things, 
because you haven't sought him, you haven't knocked on the throne room of his grace. I mean, there, because there are things in that storeroom that has not yet been released to you, not because God is not good, but because you have not prayed. You have not prayed. If that was the only reason to pray, it would be reason enough to pray, right? But wait, there's more. James, Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you may not enter temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh man, right? The spirit, when it comes to prayer, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Notice the spirit and the flesh, the physical and the spiritual. When it comes to prayer, prayer engages the spiritual realm, accesses the spiritual power, but it's done in the physical realm. Do you know when Jesus said these words? He's talking to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane while he's praying before the greatest spiritual conflict in human history. Pray so that temptation, and notice what he didn't say. He, uh, he didn't say to pray so that you can overcome temptation. He said pray so that you would not enter temptation. So what's the implication here? Friends, prayer, prayer accesses spiritual power. If I don't pray and I enter temptation, I won't have the spiritual power to overcome that temptation. I, we, I think we understand that. But he's not saying that here. He's saying that our lack of prayer, and this doesn't mean that you're prone to sin or that you wouldn't overcome that temptation. Uh, the implication is prayerlessness, our failure to pray, created a battle I didn't need to fight. My failure to pray to maintain a posture of prayer, constant communication with God, attracted a problem into my life that was unnecessary. This could have been avoided. Have you ever said that? This could have been avoided. How many battle scars do you have that you didn't need to have if you had remained in a posture of prayer? Friends, there are battles that God allows me to fight. We know that to be true. The Apostle Paul was given a thorn in the flesh that he directly attributes to spiritual conflict. 2 Corinthians 12, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me. God allowed this to happen in Paul's life. He allowed access. We'll talk about this in a moment. God allowed Satan access to Paul. There are battles that God allows into our lives, but you have to understand God will never allow a battle in your life that he does not intend for you to win. He will always equip you for the fight that he calls you to. Satan is allowed access into Paul's life to use a thorn. To, and, and Satan's intent was to destroy Paul, but God's intent was to develop Paul because of this thorn. And so we know this story. Paul asked God to remove the thorn. He said, I prayed. Then he said, I prayed. And then he said, I prayed. I, I, I prayed three times. What, what is that? It tells me that Paul continued to pray. He prayed without ceasing. He persisted in prayer over this thorn until he realized the divine purpose in this struggle that God allowed into his life. Friends, this is, this is so important when it comes to spiritual warfare. Paul prayed but didn't get the answer that he wanted. But had he not prayed, he would not have gotten the answer that he needed. Paul said, without this thorn, I would have succumbed to pride. But because of this thorn, I learned a lesson that I would not have learned otherwise. And what was it? God's grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that God's grace is sufficient for every struggle, for every fight, for every battle. The grace of God, which is to say Satan meant to harm him, but God used it for his good. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what spiritual battle you're facing. But you need to know there's a power in prayer that can overcome that battle. For Paul, prayer instigated that divine power so that he could overcome. But what Jesus is telling us in Matthew 7 is that prayer not only gives you the strength to endure what God allows, prayer gives you the discernment to avoid what God never intended. <laughs> now, if that was the only reason to pray, it would be reason enough, right? Pray at all times. Pray without ceasing. Pray about all things. And here's the lesson in all of this. I'm still learning it. There are times in my life where I am waiting on God to do something when he's actually waiting on me to do something. I mean, let's be really honest. If it matters to me, it matters to God. I know that to be true. But if it doesn't matter to me enough to pray about what matters to me and to be persistent in what matters to me, why should I expect God to do something about it? 
I mean, this is, this, this is really powerful. Jesus gave us a parable we call the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18, where the story goes that, she, that he got, excuse me, that she got what she wanted, not because the judge wanted to give it to her, but because she wouldn't stop asking. Think about this. The failure to be persistent in prayer distorts our understanding of the sovereignty of God. How many times have you chalked up unanswered prayer to the sovereignty of God? Well, I prayed about it and it didn't work, so God said no. When Jesus seems to indicate in Matthew 7 and James seems to indicate in James 4 that persistence might have brought the breakthrough that you wanted, you didn't get because you didn't persist. Now, I'll tell you, I don't know how this works in the economy of heaven. I just know this, that God calls me to pray and not to stop. And he responds when I persist. Now, here's what I believe to be the key to that persistent prayer. Number two, to pray in the Spirit. Praying at all times in the Spirit. Now, there are many understandings of this principle in church world. What it, does it mean to pray in the spirit? And depending on the kind of church maybe that you grew up in or the particular preacher that you watch on TV, uh, I'm just gonna give you my understanding of it. And again, you can agree with me or be wrong. But um, Paul qualifies persistence in this verse. It's not just that you pray over and over and over and over and over and over. Jesus actually warned us against repetitive prayers that become mindless and meaningless. Friends, the key to praying at all times is praying in the spirit. So what does that mean? Spiritual warfare starts in the mind. Prayer aligns us with the mind of God. The role of the Holy Spirit is to deliver the mind of God to my mind so that I can pray according to the mind of God. And how can I get the mind of God? Well, we learned that last week, the sword of the spirit, the sword of the spirit. Friends, you have to have both together. Ephesians 5.18 says, be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3.16 says, let the Word of God dwell in you. Friends, this is a synonymous instruction. Spirit filling and Word of God dwelling is the same thing. The role of the Spirit in your life is to confer and confirm God's truth over you and in you to remind you of who you are in Christ. Romans 8.16 says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Remember the temptation of Jesus two weeks ago, Matthew 11, excuse me, Matthew 4. The first thing Satan attacked was his identity, if you are the son of God. When he attacks your identity, the spirit testifies with your spirit that you are a child of God, confirms who you are in Christ. This applies to every spiritual stronghold. When he attacks you with fear, the spirit reminds you through the word of God that he will never leave you nor forsake you. When he attacks you with shame, The word of God confirms through the the testimony of the spirit that you have an advocate with the father. The spirit of God helps us to understand the word of God in order for us to discern and pray the will of God. And even when we can't do that, when we're struggling with how to do that, Romans 8 goes on to tell us that the spirit will actually intercede for us and pray for the things that we would want to pray, but we don't know how to pray or what to pray for. Jesus says, when you pray according to the will of God, God responds. Pray in the spirit. What does that mean? Friends, in its simplest form, and it's not, it's not complicated. Anybody, any, any believer at any level of spiritual maturity can do this, friends. The mind of God is the word of God, and when you know the word of God, you can pray the will of God. The word of, the word of God is the will of God, and when you, when you pray the word of God, you are praying the will of God, and Jesus told us that when we do that, God hears us. So in its most basic form, to pray in the Spirit, is to pray the will of God discovered in the word of God. This is not mystical. It is not secretive. You can, believer, know the mind of God because you have the word of God and the spirit of God guiding you. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, 2020, I did a series through the book of Daniel and looked in chapter 10 of that story where Daniel is given a behind-the-scenes perspective on prayer and the part that it plays in spiritual warfare. Again, everything visible and physical is preceded by what is invisible and spiritual. And so in chapter 10 of Daniel, we are told that Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. And that prayer and that fasting initiated a spiritual battle in the spirit realm. But in cha- we are told in chapter 9 what instigated the prayer and what the nature of that prayer was. What did Daniel pray that instigated the spiritual battle. Verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, In the first year of his reign, his reign, referring to Darius, the king of Babylon, the Israelites 
are in captivity in Babylon. Daniel says, I perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. So notice that the books, Jeremiah, the prophet, the word of the Lord. So he's, he's reading the word of God. Okay, he's filling himself with the word of God, trying to understand the word of God. Uh, according to the word of God, the Lord, uh, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, name, namely 70 years. So the Israelites are captives in Babylon. Daniel's a captive in Babylon. Jeremiah is a contemporary of Daniel who recorded these prophecies and put them in written form so that Daniel could read them. Talking about the return of, of the Israelites uh, from captivity. And so by the time we get to chapter 10, it's been, that, those, that 70 years is about ready to come to an end. This time is at hand. And so Daniel is reading this, and it prompts him to pray and fast. And he's been praying and fasting for 21 days. Now, so, so you got that, right? He's praying in the Spirit according to the Word of God. The Word of God is prompting his prayers and aligning it with the thoughts of of the Spirit. He's praying the thoughts of God, the mind of God that he has discovered from the Word of God. And in the middle of that prayer time, that time of fasting in chapter 10, he has a vision of Jesus, which just throws him to the ground. His face is on the ground. And then an angel of the Lord comes and wakes him up and says to him in verse 12, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Your words were heard, and I have come, and I have come in response to them. In other words, Daniel, you've, got, you've been praying and fasting for 21 days to get an answer to this vision, and I want you to know that the first day that you prayed and fasted, God heard, about that, heard that prayer and responded to that prayer. So what's the deal? 21 days? Daniel prayed. God heard. God responded. But the angel says, it took me 21 days to get to you. Verse 13, the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, God's angel, one of the chief princes, came to me to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. We don't have time to get into all the details. But what he's, he's talking about, friends, what Paul talks about in Ephesians. He's talking about principalities and powers of this dark world. He's talking about uh, the spirit realm exercising dominion over the physical realm. Verse 14, now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So uh, it w the series was called Thrive. We talked about spiritual warfare in that, in that sermon on chapter 10. But today I want to focus on the issue of prayer and how that plays into the spiritual warfare. What do we learn from that story? Well, number one, prayer is war. Prayer is war. Friends, every time you pray in the spirit according to the word of God, you are engaging the spiritual with the physical and it instigates a conflict in the spiritual realm where God is eager and able to, re to respond and answer, but Satan is just as intent to block and thwart. That's what's happening. Satan does not want you to pray. Satan does not want you to live and operate in the flow of the Spirit. Prayer is war. The second thing we learn is that prayer denied is not prayer, excuse me, prayer delayed is not prayer denied. Prayer delayed is not prayer denied when you're praying in the Spirit according to the Word of God. What's the longest you've ever had to wait for an answer to prayer? What's the longest that you've ever had to wait for God to respond to your prayer? Some of you are still waiting. And like the Israelites in Judges 3, you're getting tired. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you're like the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord, how long, how long? How long? And you're tempted to quit because it's, it's a fight. Prayer is a fight. Back to Philippians 4. This, is always, this has always encouraged me. Paul tells us to pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thanksgiving. Pray. pray not, don't thank God after you get the answer. Thank God before you get the answer. Why? Because God has, when he hears your prayer, he has always, already answered your prayer. And just because you haven't gotten the answer to that prayer doesn't mean that God hasn't answered that prayer. The moment you pray, God hears. The moment you pray, God responds. You may not get the response right away. You may have to wait for that answer. Evidently, there's something in the waiting that God wants to do or something in the waiting that God wants me to do. Maybe it's time to pray about that. When you understand spiritual warfare, unless you know what's happening in the invisible realm, all you see is God not responding in the visible realm when all the time God is working behind the scenes to bring about the purpose 
of his kingdom. Every prayer prayed in the spirit is an act of war. It is giving earthly permission for heavenly interference. So, but, but to do that uh, engages an enemy set on blocking that, that answer to prayer and protecting his own domain. So this, so this is war. Prayer is asking God to do what he wants to do, but is not going to do until he's been invited to do it by our prayers. So God would not tell us to do this if it, if it didn't matter, right? Jesus would not teach us to pray if this was a waste of time. It matters. You have no idea what's happening behind the scenes when you pray. You have no idea what's happening because you're of your failure to pray, what's not happening. You have no idea what will happen if you just keep praying. Realize this, understand this, allow this to change your prayer life. There are answers in heaven for prayers you have yet to pray. Remember Paul's prayer in Ephesians, that powerful prayer that God would do immeasurably far more than we could ask or imagine. Think about this. Paul never assumed that God would do that. That's why he prayed that God would do that. God may be waiting on you to do something that he is willing to do through you and for you, but you just haven't asked him yet because you haven't yet persisted in that request. Pray at all times. Pray at all times. Pray at all times in the Spirit. And here's the final one. Pray at all times in the Spirit for all the saints. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, immediately following that verse is this verse in verse 19. And Paul says, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, <laughs> pray for me. Who do you pray for? And who prays for you? Paul was always asking people to pray for him. He was always praying for others because he understood the, the warfare involved. He understood the stakes of unprayed prayers. We call it intercessory prayer. Uh, the practice of interceding uh, for another person in the act of prayer. It is a vital strength to the church to pray for one another in the church. It's all through the Bible, men and women praying on behalf of men and women uh, in, uh, on, in prayer on their behalf. In the Daniel story, this was an intercessory prayer. Daniel is praying for the people of God. Uh, all the prophets interceded for the people of God. The word intercede means simply to bring two parties together. The word intercede uh, means to bring one person to another person to bring them together. So it doesn't necessarily mean to pray, but you can pray intercessory prayers by bringing a person, a human being, to the throne room of grace by your prayers. Romans 8 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. He brings us to God with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes. He brings us to God according to the will of God. Now, I, I, I want to tell you, we, we do, he says, verse 26, we do not know. We do not know. We do, we do not know. We do not know what's going on behind the scenes. We do not know what's happening in the heavenlies. What we do know is that in our prayers, in our prayers, we release divine power to demolish and destroy what is trying to destroy us. So the Spirit intercedes with a prayer we don't know how to pray. And get this, he intercedes according to the will of God because he, because he knows what's going on in the heavenlies. He understands and so he knows how to pray for us when we don't know how to pray or what to pray for. Here in Ephesians, the saints intercede for the saints. When you pray for someone, you are bringing that person into the throne room of grace, representing that person to God in your prayers. 2 Timothy 2.1 tells us to pray for everyone. The prophet Samuel, this is powerful, he told Saul, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord, that I would sin against God by not praying for you. Our failure to pray for one another is an offense to God. It is wrong for me not to pray for you. Who do you pray for? Who prays for you? Who do you stand in the gap on their behalf in this spiritual warfare that we're all involved in? One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Peter, and one of my favorite stories is found in Luke 22, where Jesus says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. One of the reasons why we like Peter so much is because Peter is so much like us, right? He is going to deny Jesus three times. He doesn't know that yet. In fact, he's convinced that he is the only one in the group that is going to stick it out. But Jesus knows better. 
And so he he warns Peter of this failure. But notice the optimism in Jesus' voice. He says, when you have turned, when you have turned. Peter, you're going to mess up, but it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. How does Jesus know this? Because he prayed. He prayed. He interceded. Peter, I prayed for you. And and you're going, to, you're going to turn from your failure. God is going to use that failure to strengthen other failures, which is you and me. <laughs> Here's what I want you to see, though. Notice what, what it says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Demand, believe or understand this. Satan does, not have, Satan does not have access to you without God's permission. He can trouble you, but he cannot possess you because you belong to God. In the Old Testament, Satan had to ask for permission to, act, to get access to Job. That was a spiritual warfare being enacted in Job's life. In the book of Jude in the, in the New Testament, right before Revelation, uh, it's only one chapter long, so it won't take you very long to read it, but there's this really weird story about Satan uh, fighting, arguing with Gabriel uh, over the body of Moses, and Satan wants the body of Moses, and Michael says, you can't have him, he belongs to us. It's a really weird story. You can read it. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a similar principle. Satan wants access. He can't have it without God's permission. And, P, and Jesus says to Simon, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. For what purpose? To destroy you. He wants to take your failure and make you a failure. He knows how to get to Peter. He knows how to tempt Peter. So there's this tug of war between God and Satan in the spiritual realm over the body of Peter and Jesus is the tiebreaker. Verse 20, 32, but I have prayed for you, Peter. I have prayed for you. Jesus goes to God and intercedes on Peter's behalf and says to God, you know what? Peter belongs to me. Would you protect him from this temptation? Would you keep him from destruction? Peter belongs to me. Believer, what, P- what Jesus did for Peter, he's doing for you right now. Do you realize that? He's doing that for you right now. He is standing before God as your advocate, as your mediator, as your intercessor, standing before God with all the accusations of your enemy coming at them. And he's saying, God, he's mine. He's mine. She's mine. She's mine. And what Jesus does for you, friends, he's telling us to do for each other, to pray for one another, that we might be protected from the evil one, that we might stand firm in the spiritual battle, that we might experience the victory that only comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. The person standing before you today, right now, giving you these words, needs your prayers. (laughs) Would you pray for me? The The person sitting right next to you, the person sitting next to you right now, you have no idea the spiritual battle that's going on in their lives. You may know part of it. You don't know all of it. They don't know all of it. They need your prayers. The church of Jesus Christ needs your prayers. Who do you pray for? Who prays for you? What shall we do in response to all these things? We should pray. Would you pray with me? Father, Father in heaven who knows our needs and wants to give us more, wants to give us good gifts, into your hands we commit our spirits. Into your hands we surrender our very lives. Teach us to pray. Encourage us because of the cross to pray. Empower us by the presence of your spirit in us to pray. Give us a hunger for your word so that we might pray according to your will. And thank you. Thank you for hearing us and answering us and for however long it takes for us to receive it. We know by faith that you are good and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.